just in the, the, mean, okay. the meantime. I don't know if we can or not. Oh, have we started? It looks like we have started. Welcome to the Scottish Liberty Podcast, episode 114. Uh, With 114. me, Anthony Samroff. That was quick. Whatever happened to 113? <laughs> <laughs> we just finished it. Um, and Tom Laird, who's looking at our first news story, second news story. Uh, second news story. Well, yeah, we'll kick off. Why not? Welcome to the show again. If you're if you're uh, if you're still around, ha, Adam Smasher. Didn't see that one coming, did you? Yeah, you didn't. <laughs> so uh, our biggest fan. So basically, what I wanted to talk about uh, was the idea of the social credit system that has been no. I wasn't going to start with that. I was going to start with Luxembourg, wasn't it? You can start with social credit. Let's do it. Okay. The social credit system in China, basically, China has introduced... Can you remember a while back, this is just slight asides, but it's connected. There was a, a movie that came out, and it was about a system in society that was based on people upvoting or downvoting you. So everybody would go around with little badges on, a green badge and a red badge. And if you said anything that upset anybody, they would hit your red badge. And if oh. you said anything that was really good and you blew smoke up people's backsides, they hit the green part. Yes, and and, and, like and you and you basically gain as you. So it wasn't just confined to social media. As you interacted with real people, you gained social credit for doing for having positive attitudes and what yeah. was ever deemed positive behavior yeah and i bet all the girls all the women went for the people who had tons of red badges <laughs> yeah so who knows but china have introduced a system um basically of social credit where bear with me because i'm complete oh, here we go Complete, Why China's social credit? I'm, ta I'm, ta I'm taking the this, this article from uh, the, the Foundation, Foundation for Economic, Economic Education, Education, which uh, wasn't that Henry Hazlitt's uh, brainchild? Uh, I don't know. It might have been Lawrence Reed. Okay, uh, there's how much I know. I thought it was Someone Henry. I thought that, Henry uh, Hazlitt had something to do with it. He I'm did sure. Contribute. Okay. So, news of China's social credit system has been making waves across media outlets for months. Some publications are going soft in the massive surveillance state, saying it is not as bad as it seems. It is. While others are referring to it as something straight out of 1984. Again, it is. With pilot programs operating in certain municipalities, the system is already affecting citizens' lives by limiting their ability to travel or send their children to universities. Four million people have been blocked from buying high-speed train tickets over low social credit. Vice News reported earlier this year, and more uh, quote, and more than 11 million from people have been barred from buying flights. Shocking. Uh, and you know they'll be barred from going abroad. Government documents detailing the social credit system say the program will quote allow the trustworthy, right, whoever they are, to roam everywhere under heaven while making it hard for the discredited to take a single step. Unquote. The final version of the social credit system is expected to be fully implemented by 2020, but Beijing, why did you call it that? It's Peking, okay? Beijing. It's, it's probably not even Beijing, it's probably Beijing, right? So it's probably it's probably just as insulting to say Beijing as it is to say Peking. Interesting, because um, uh, <laughs> India have renamed a lot of their cities. Yeah. <coughs> and the Indian names, but it's it's really silly because it's it's actually a sign that you're on the world stage that people have their own names. Well, exactly, for your it's it's kind of cities. weird. I mean, like nobody, you know, I guess people uh, do they? I mean, do, do the French call it London or they say Londres? Probably mm -hmm. say Londres. Londres. <coughs> yeah, um, but they're French, so who cares? So anyway, so Be Beijing or Peking, if you prefer, is being vague regarding the confirmed list of offences and how the program will work. Here are some of the actions the Chinese government deems, quote, bad behaviours that warrant punishment. Now, some of these you, you might go fair enough on the surface, okay? Bad driving or traffic offences, okay? But then bear in mind, there's already laws against that anyway, yeah. right? Uh, jaywalking, smoking on trains, not cleaning up after your dog, not having your dog on a leash, right? Okay, but that's right. not paying debts, fair enough. Not paying taxes, okay. Now we're starting to get into the, the the realms. Playing too many video games, watching pornography. 
again, you have to define you know what exactly is pornography. Some people might find something that's uh, remotely erotic, pornographic. Making frivolous purchases. Who gets to decide what is? Well, obviously the government does get to decide what's a frivolous purchase. Consuming too much alcohol or junk food. Criticizing the government. Uh, criticizing the social credit system. <laughs> Visiting unauthorized websites. Are being friends with or messaging others with low scores or those who commit the above offences. So not only am I to be subjected to the system, but merely for associating with Tom, I'm yeah. bound. Yeah, to you're, be double, you're double fucked. Some transgressions may be a double dunter. Some transgressions may be worthy of punishment, like not paying debts or traffic citations. However, one can already identify some issues with alleged wrongdoing, such as what defines fake news or a frivolous purchase or too much gaming. Um, so, and the, the the article goes on to postulate, um, rightly in my view, that this could end up, I mean, China already has a lot of corruption. It's not uncommon. I knew somebody who was a lecturer at a university here in Edinburgh, and there's a lot of Chinese students uh, in Edinburgh at the moment. And they've been handed envelopes with money in it from Chinese students and saying, there you go. Uh, and they just expect that it'd be the same, that, that they'd be given a pass because there's some money in an envelope. Um, because that works in China. There's all sorts of ways. If you want up the housing list, if you want to get off of a traffic thing. Um, uh, sorry, David Laird has just joined us, my, my bro, my brother, and he says, uh, I believe that they want this system here. I think the EU would love that stuff. Yeah, I agree. So anyway, um, where was I before uh, my brother interrupted me? <laughs> you were saying about how uh, the Chinese are corruption. Yeah, well, is the, the, there is corruption. There uh, is, obviously. Uh, there is, a, But there is a, a hell of a lot of corruption in China, and this could only exacerbate it because there'd be ways of avoiding... I mean, the rich will be able to avoid these things by paying bribes, and really it's only the poor who's going to be affected, as always. And it is extremely problematic um, to for government to start deciding, you know, how much gaming that you play is 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 is, is wrong. Certainly, criticizing the government that could that could be anything. I mean, even if it's legitimate criticism. Um, yeah, but that's there's a long history of not that not yeah. being allowed in China being yeah. a totalitarian government for a long time. You couldn't criticize the government. You might even end up, you know, severely. Uh, Honest, you might be end up being incarcerated for criticizing the Chinese government. <laughs> Adam Smasher's back with us. So here's the thing: Can you imagine this system that they're they're they're, they're going to go ahead with in China? Um, can you imagine this system here in the UK? I can imagine it, but coupled with the uni uh, the universal basic income. Oh my God! Yeah, that's a good point. So I mean, even social services. You know, if you are on social services, get off them. Um, but if you are on social services, you know, you you could be restricted to to your um, your access to social services because you're deemed by the government of being an unworthy person. You get too low a score. And then to get your score back up, of <coughs> course, uh, you will need to do your community Penance. service or whatever, or yeah. maybe even worse, be sent to a education camp i mean i'm thinking of pairing this with the current culture for um the victimhood culture that we've just explored in our last podcast which is oh you know you're micro you've got these complaints for microaggressing or you've got these unsavory views because you don't accept that the wage gap is yeah real and you've expressed that and you you've made an off-color joke you must be a sexist uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's quite scary, the implications of it. I think that pairing it to universal basic income is a good point. I think <clears throat> if there's one thing we're lucky about, the UBI as it stands is completely unaffordable at the moment. But take it down 10 years down the line with more automation, a society is richer, um, that it's possible that something like this could be introduced at some time. So, and even online, you know, there are people who actually think that this is a good idea. And if you think about it, it's sinister in the way that we're kind of already doing it with Facebook 
and with Twitter, you know, people, you know, you like something or you yes. you, 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 you so downvote something. People are used to it. People Especially because they're, they're used to doing this. You know, you say, okay, you know, let's grass up your neighbours. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't seem to be, you know, there'll be no due process. It's not evidence-based. It's just if enough people say you're a pedophile, guess what? You're a pedophile. If enough people say that you're just uh, anti-social, um, that's me, um, pretty anti-social guy, then that, that's what you are. You're anti-social. And as we know in the Soviet Union and in China uh, and during Maoist China, being anti-social was one of the worst things you could be accused of. And it was also so widespread and vague. Anything could be come under the umbrella of being antisocial. <clears throat> so I think this is bad. It's going to be bad for Chinese people, clearly. Uh, but, I mean, I sent this article to somebody, and they just went, yeah, well, I, I don't know whether they really meant it or whether they've been sarcastic, saying, like, well, thank God I don't live in China. You know, yeah. And, and it was, I think it was more sarcasm. In other words, you know, you know, why are you bothering about this? We don't live in China, you know, we live in the UK. Well, do you know what? We live in a global village. We do live in a global village. And I think right now, as we speak at universities and on campuses, I think a lot of social justice warrior -y types will be loving this idea mm. because uh, they yes. think they have the momentum. They think they have the upper hand and they have the point of critical mass in order to, because this is a, a strange thing I noticed with the people on the left. When, whenever you talk about welfare and healthcare, they will say things like, "Well, we can't allow people to, to fall." Because you, know, you say, like, "Okay, what about somebody who's a, a, a rapist and a murderer and a, and a housebreaker and a wife beater?" And they go, "Oh, we can't let people fall through the net." You know. However, those same people, if you are not on the same page as them. If you don't agree with them politically, not only will they let you fall through the net, they'll cut a hole in the net and shove you through it gleefully. Yeah, and Penn Shapiro being yeah. banned from a campus, this one. Right, I don't agree with a lot of what Ben Shapiro has to say. He's, he's sort of occasionally good on economics or what. It's you know, duendry. all the same, all the same. Like that comment, for example, <laughs> would give him low social credit. Yeah. Actually, that's a hate crime. Under yep. the law in Scotland, so someone please it report could be, him. Yeah, it's probably uh, will. So uh, the thing is, it reminds me. Well, one of the things we like about the free market is that companies can copy other companies' idea to the extent that the government isn't giving patents and things like that. Products get better. Uh, companies can look at what other companies are doing and go, let's improve our product by copying what they're doing, but making it even better. Yeah. Uh, and now we have this. Uh, competition between governments uh, or at least they're learning each other's tricks and it reminds me of Hoppe saying you know Hans Hermann Hoppe H3 as I like to call him but it's not caught on yet and um, he's he says well you know we want the government the uh, the we want competition in the production of goods, but not in the production of bads yeah. <laughs> which is quite a funny thing to say you know and the, I, I feel like <coughs> What I don't know if we're getting sociological here, but you know the the what kind of person goes into government? Are they, are they looking to remake the world? Uh, are, are they going to be dri a driven by utopianism, which is how can we socially engineer the kind of society where everyone's nice to each other? Or on the other hand, driven by authoritarianism, and uh, like how can we? What's the best way to keep the sheep in line? Yeah. Well. Everyone knows who's the fucking sheepdog, right? Yeah. Everyone knows who the king is, right? But if you can do away with the sheepdog and then just get the sheep to police one another, then it's like you've got this horizontal control net. Oh, we can all, under democracy, we can all be the king, yeah. right? So, so it's us. <coughs> it makes it uh, seemingly innocuous. Yeah. So, I mean... As libertarians, you know, what do we what do we do about this? Let's suppose this thing is coming in. <laughs> yeah, we can bitch and moan about it. Or we could actually you know, the the good book says, you know, the, the, the prudent see danger and take refuge, but the you know, the, 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 the unwise um don't do anything and suffer for it. So what 
what do we do about it? Is it this is this is the time to start making things happen in terms of alternative medias and alternative uh, payment methods, and that feeds us in to uh, what's happening with uh, Dave Rubin and Jordan Peterson, and probably yes. Sam Harris has jumped aboard yes. now. You're going to tell us what's going on there in order uh, to to avoid to try and avoid this kind of state intervention and uh, prevent this from access and things that we that we that we need like utilities. Right. Well, I mean, I think <coughs> the, the late Sam Harris considered going off Patreon before. Of course, he's a leading intellectual in the world today. We would uh, consider going uh, off it if we hadn't if we never had, if we never got on it in more, the first place. More on that in a minute, actually. Yeah. Um, he wrote into them about other people being banned or deplatformed and so forth at the time. He was reporting on it to his listeners and they assured him that this wasn't the kind of thing that was going to be happening and that he'd be safe and so on. But recently, Zargon of Akkad, someone who I think is pretty innocuous, I personally don't have much time for him. What I think he's smug beyond his level of insight I know that people will say that I may be a little bit. Yeah, I've got. A, I've some got. Kettles, uh. I've got a little bit. I don't think. I don't consider myself a smug. I have been uh, accused of time of having an ego, but I would say to that, being being pretentious is having an uh, thinking that you're worthy of more praise than you are. But I think I'm worthy of about as much praise as I am actually <laughs> worthy of and therefore actually not pretentious I'm excluded from being pretentious because I am actually as brilliant as I think I am or almost as brilliant as I think I am I one of the reasons why I, one, one of the one. reasons why I resent Sargon of Akkad isn't is that he isn't as brilliant as us and yet he's speaking to hundreds of thousands of people and uh yeah yeah, I think you can anyway, get his sound right occasionally. Though. <laughs> that's true. That does help. Yeah, I, I, no, I just didn't think that his the level of insight he is offering is congruent with his audience. But maybe he does appeal to a wider audience because he is. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll speak up for a second. Just to, he's certainly he's certainly brave and he's tenacious as well. Yeah, I mean he's he, he's. <sighs> You know, you, there's a certain amount of risk involved in taking on these subjects and um, and and getting involved and putting your your name out there. You putting know, he's your been dick on the line, putting your dick on the on the table for a you know for a mallet to come down on it, and he is he's he's done it, and uh, you know, fair play to him for that at least. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a, it's a difficult thing to do um, here in the UK. Like I say, you'll be doxxed, you'll get, you know, gangs of people, if they find out where they you live, you know, they'll come round, they'll intimidate you, uh, as happened to uh, Cucker Carlson recently on, uh, in America. Uh, they'll, they'll do that kind of thing. They'll, if they can, they'll contact your HR department and work, they'll try and get you to, they'll try and get them to, to throw you out of your job. So, you know, fair, fair play to him on that. I mean, I don't watch a lot of his stuff. I used to watch some of his stuff in the old days where he was going on, he was banging on more about feminism than he was about Islam. Um, as I've said before, Islam, militant Islam is a, is a problem in terms of your physical uh, well-being, but in terms of your uh, free speech, it's not Islam that's the problem, it's our own fucking politicians that are the problem. <coughs> so I'll give him credit for that. Um, he A bit like Stephen Molyneux, I felt he had a tendency to go on mm, a bit yeah, too, too long. Yeah, too long a yeah. video. Yeah. And, uh, but, what I'd but anyway... In Good, response, play, yeah. in response to Zargon of Cad being deplatformed from Patreon, Sam Harris has come off, and he was one of the biggest people. He was maybe something like twelfth or something like that. I don't know exactly, but he was getting a lot of money on via Patreon, and so it's a big deal that he came off. Now we have never gone on Patreon. Because in the UK, you will be taxed 20% on your donations from Patreon. But wow. help may be at hand. And I thought it was fundamentally unlibertarian for us to, to, to do that. Now, help may be at hand. Jordan Peterson and Dave Rubin, just prior to Sam Harris coming, on Patre coming off Patreon, announced that they're working on a new platform for funding. And maybe we'll do that and get some donations because it... It would help us increase our production values, pay for train fares and things like that. And uh, mundane stuff. Like and that. mundane stuff. So if you do want to 
donate to Scottish Liberty Podcast, you can PayPal me at frequency528 at hotmail.co.uk and that helps pay for the SoundCloud and what have you. So uh, David says again, you guys should make a four-hour marathon video of just total ranting. I would watch it. Well, well I mean... We well, do, we've came close sometimes. Um, we did that one on <coughs> Facebook once, which was on an election night, but I never yeah. saw YouTube, which is a shame. Didn't it? I don't think it's on our YouTube channel. Maybe I'll dig it out if people request it. Okay. Uh, David, there's also the two-hour-long-ish one where we shave my head, which has been much loved by the people who Shaved saw it. Shit. I was actually <laughs> impressed by the fact that I could consistently take the piss out of all our guests one after another. And they barely retaliated. Can you believe that? So what would be your dream team there if we were going to do a four-hour marathon? Uh, would it just be me and Anthony or uh, who else would we have on there? Uh, what, what Ideally, what 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 guys would we would we have on there to uh, to to join in the rant and Who's those the, of you who are the rant meisters those out there? of you listen on soundcloud come on to youtube and tell us via comment yeah uh who you'd like to have on the marathon because we might just make it happen we might have, for yeah, you sounds, we could do that and, uh, and especially with new year's i think there up. should be yeah exactly there should be alcohol involved yeah definitely yeah. Uh, because if, I, we, if we don't become enormously successful we could at least just get the jail I did really <laughs> love that big long live stream we did with all our friends. Bill Burr, really, love to have really Bill on, but I don't think it's going to happen. Okay, so so is yeah. there anything more to say about Jordan Peterson and Dave Rubin starting well, a new platform? Well, it's a start. I mean, they, they've they've said that this is going to happen, um, and it's it's overdue. You know, I suppose there comes a point of critical mass where people just go, "I don't want to jump just yet. I don't want to just." jump just yet and then when you do jump and you're obviously going to look I mean I think the catalyst was for Sam Harris and uh, Dave Rubin was looking and people were saying to him look love you guys uh, love donating but this isn't personal it's not about you I'm not giving any more fucking money to Patreon it's just not happening anymore and that gave them the, the, the boost they needed to go right okay we need to do something about this and find another platform so as libertarians there are we're a, we're a smart bunch you know we should be ahead of the game on this yes, uh, and I, I mean i'm not i'm, I'm not that way inclined I, I don't know i mean i, I kind of have visions about what it should look like and what it should be but i don't have the technological wherewithal in order to do it but there are people out there who do and you know whether it's using cryptocurrencies or you know other crypto forms of media we need to get out of the situation yeah. in which the system can shut us down at the drop of a hat and deny us a livelihood uh, and deny us access to things like public transport because it's coming. That is yeah, coming. You won't be able to buy a, a, a flight or a plane ticket or, or just do the things that you're used to because government will do. You suddenly just find that your your, your money's no good around here anymore. Right. And as, as much good as uh, theorising on how privatised garbage collection will do... There's enough theor theorizing will work. There's enough theorizing about uh, what a libertarian utopia would look like. A little bit more brain power and how we create alternative systems within the present system. Yeah, uh, that would be a great use of libertarian yeah. brain power. All you agorists out there, this should be right up your street I because go, uh, rest, 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 rest. rest. <laughs> <laughs> to do that and it just never tires so uh yeah you guys you know you know sec three you know samuel edward conkin the third banged on a lot about this you know making the state irrelevant you know let's let's start doing it um it, it, it'd be great <laughs> to just to be able for the state to be just sitting there making rules and regulations and nobody's bothered or yeah. about it. You know? Which, by the way, well, would happen <coughs> yeah. if things ever got serious in terms of living standards. People would just start ignoring the minimum wage and live and uh, labour conditions and just do whatever would get them a buck. Now, <coughs> is there enough on that? Do you want to go on to our third and final story? We'll go on to our third and final story. If it, Well, basically, um, Luxembourg, Ooh, yeah, Luxembourg. if you know where that is, it's uh, it's part of the European Union. It's a small country in the Benelux, so sort of Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, um, and it's pretty small. Is it a principality? Would you say? I don't know what the day micro state. Micro state. It's, just, it's quite a small place, Luxembourg. It's mostly rich people who live there. 
Uh, it, I think it's quite a wealthy country. I don't think it's quite a Monaco or. Do they a, have a monarchy? A, they do have a. They, a, do. Well, they have a. I think they have a grand duchy. And it's really, really hard to immigrate there because everyone would want to. I don't know if it's hard to immigrate to, to Luxembourg. I think it is. It's, it's well, it's it part of the EU. Technically, you telling us last week that you can get there without a passport, even. Oh, well, you can. You guys can give us the lowdown. Yeah. So anyway, Luxembourg has decided, right? While rail travellers in Britain, this is from the Independent, a UK newspaper. While rail travellers in Britain prepare for tickets to cost 3.1 percent more in 2019, Luxembourg is set to become the first country in the world to abolish all fares on public transport. A new coalition government is taking office in the Grand Duchy with the promise of abolishing, past the Grand Duchy on the left hand side, yeah. with the promise of abolishing, abolishing tickets on trains, trams and buses next, next summer. summer. At present, fares are capped at a low level, Holy two goodness. euro for up to two hours of travel, which in a small nation covers almost any journey. Luxembourg's area is 999 square miles. Almost, You'd think they could have made an effort to get another square mile yeah, in there. I know, it's right, you know. <laughs> so Luxembourg's area is 999 square miles, almost the same as Oxfordshire. Anyone who wants to include first-class rail pays three euro an all-day second-class ticket on every form of public transport costs four euro. Four euros what in dollars? About six dollars? Five, six, yeah. Yeah, correct. Young people travel free, and many commuters qualify for an annual impasse, which costs 150 euro for all public transport. Sounds grand. Luxembourg's transport system costs close to one billion euro per year. That's with a B. To operate, but partly as a result of the concessionary offers, fares amount to only 30 million euro annually. So it's only a very 3% of the total cost is paid for by rail by users. By the consumers, yeah. From summer 2019, tickets are set to be abolished. Part of the cost will be covered by removing a tax break for commuters. The move will sit. Uh, I'm sorry, removing a tax break for commuters. Right, the move will save on the collection and processing of fares, obviously. So, uh, how does that work with jobs? Uh, it may also encourage a shift away from private cars. Traffic congestion, especially around Luxembourg City, is a serious problem. <coughs> <coughs> we've got, we've got, both of us have got yeah, a stinking case of something here. Um, S socialism. Some city centres around the world offer free transport in a bid to reduce congestion, and in some US counties the bus system is free. But no other nation has eliminated fares from the entire transport network. Not every commuter is convinced about the idea. Claude Moyen, a teacher who travels by train to his school in the town of Dieker uh, every day, says he feared the quality of journeys might suffer. No shit, Sherlock. And added, quote, I'm not sure if making public transport free here in Luxembourg will take more people out of their cars, unquote. If the idea is deemed a success, neighbouring France may start to remove, quote, peppercorn fares from some bus services. At present, passengers can travel for many miles to and from cities such as Nice, Perpignan, for a flat fare of just one euro. The issue still to be considered in Luxembourg is the likelihood that homeless people mm. may shrewdly decide to move from the streets to the trains in winter in order to stay warm, can't blame them, while they travel the nation. <laughs> Sounds like a great idea. In addition, no decision has been taken how to handle the present demarcation between first and second class compartments on the trains. The coalition of the centrist Democratic Party and left-wing Socialist Workers' Party and the Greens, yeah, it's all the lefties, is led by Premier designate Xavier Bettel. It is known as the quote Gambia coalition because the party's colours are blue, red, and green, respectively, which together Cultural are the colours of the Gambian flag. Yeah, Gambia. I think you'll find it's the Gambia, okay, but like the France, so you don't confuse it with any other Gambia or France that's out there. Uh, the new government is also aiming to legalise cannabis and to produce, introduce two new public holidays, including one on May the 9th called Europe, Europe Day. Day. Well, that's right. two green policies <coughs> there. One, uh, the legalization of cannabis, the other, the public transport thing. So what's wrong with this? What could be wrong with, uh, with free transport for everybody? Free, it's great. Free well, stuff. We all I, love free stuff. I certainly do. Yeah. Well, 
I guess on if I'm going to be charitable, it's nice to see people put their money where their mouth is when it comes yeah. to this global warming thing, because they talk, 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 but at least uh, they're acting on principle now. Now, I guess uh, the, the interesting case study, the town of Hassel in Belgium mm. city, I guess. Yeah, town. well, it's neighbouring. Well, Belgium's neighbouring to Luxembourg, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a Flemish city and municipality. They actually tried this to make all the public transport free. They started in 1996. And it's interesting enough from a Scottish point of view because in the 1990, uh, 10 years later, around 2007, the Scottish Socialist Party put out a party broadcast saying how great it was that Hassel did this yeah. and that we should have the same thing in Scotland. And I read the time, I thought, hmm. Maybe that wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, I wasn't libertarian yet, although I was on the and I was libertarian say, what train. What was wrong with you? Um, interestingly enough, six years after that, in twenty thirteen, the scheme collapsed. They said that uh, began. Uh, let's see what we've got here. The cost quadrupled in ten years. If you look at the nine the nineteen ninety six figure, three hundred sixty thousand people were using it. Two thousand and six, when it was cancelled, four point six million <coughs> passengers were using it. Now, from one perspective, you could say, "Well, this is great. Four point six million people are out there, cars, less traffic, congestion, less pollution, and maybe it would be nice if it was voluntarily funded." The po problem is. Without prices, there's no way of really determining which services are really needed and yeah. which people are just climbing on for the sake of it. Like, how do you know, like, whether there should be a direct bus from, say, here to Fife? The only really way to know is to have prices. How regular should the bus be? Open it up. We, of course, don't have a free market in the provision of public transport here. In fact, you'll find that only three or four companies run. We've got First, um, and for intercity uh, travel, CityLink, National Express, and Megabus, who are basically, if you look at the shareholder, I think Megabus owns CityLink now. Did they buy them over? Uh, it's perfectly possible, or maybe the other well, way around. I've no yeah, idea. yeah. So, <clears throat> so we have a monopoly. They have licenses. Open it up to the free market. Anyone who can get a bus or a van can take people from X to Y and take payment for it. Yeah. And then you would have much more extensive public transport. But you simply cannot meet the demand uh, or know which demand is legitimate and which isn't. The pricing things below the market clearing rate always creates an excess of demand. And who do you know who needs that seat more? Um, yeah. You know, how, how do you distribute the seats? Um, the, the 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 when you put things for free, imagine people gave out free ice cream, or I'll take a better example. Prince thinking that he was a great guy, um, that great composer Prince, the the rock musician, the funk soul, whatever, yeah. all sorts of genres musician, weird, all round weird guy, all round weird guy, thought he'd be really cool and great and price his ticket concerts not not above twenty dollars or whatever it was. And of course, when he came to the UK, all of the tickets were instantly sold out. Now, all that means is that really great, but really huge Prince fans can't get a seat at one of his concerts. Well, as people go, oh, the tickets are only fifteen pounds. Like, let you know, they they buy them all up. So the people, who, there's not really an appropriate uh, rationing of services according yeah. to needs when you price things below the market rate. So that's my concern. Apart, quite apart, that's the economic concern, quite yeah. apart from the coercive way that it's being funded. So I think what we're going to see with this scheme in Luxembourg is it will be likely to collapse. Uh, but the thing but is, not, <coughs> we'll because Luxembourg is a relatively wealthy country, yeah. they may be able to drag it out for a lot longer than the Belgian town did. And it may, have, it may seem, especially when this coalition has a vested interest in it working. You know, never underestimate their ability to cover up yeah. and make it look like. a lot more successful than it is. So it could last 10 years. In the meantime, 
left-wing parties here in the UK, like the Scottish Socialists, say, well, they're, and, and by the way, it's a logical conclusion. If you, as we do at the moment here in the UK, subsidise public transport, why wouldn't you just go all the way and say, well, why subsidise it? If you know, Let's just make it free. <clears throat> yes. Um, and it's got a lot of good sounding uh, reason. I, you know, you, 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 it's going to be cheaper to run because you're not going to have to have, uh, you know, ticket collectors, ticket sellers. You're not going to have to produce tickets. You know, that sounds um, superficially plausible. Uh, you know, but at the same token, why would we think that this? Okay, if you think that public transport should be free, why shouldn't supermarkets be free? Why shouldn't you just be able to say, right, okay, we're going to tax everybody and then we're going to have supermarkets and anybody can just go in yeah. anytime they like and pick up what they want and leave. And, and it's going to be cheaper wastage. to run the supermarket because you won't need people in there to man the tills. Yeah, and there'll be yeah. incredible amounts of wastage. You know, kids going in there and picking up a whole bunch of cabbages just so that they can go out and play fight with them and throw them at each yeah. other. Well, that, well, the wastage <laughs> there is, is far more easy to see. You can, people can see that immediately. Whereas with public transport, you don't see the, the it's not so stark. Yeah, but someone might not get a seat because <coughs> some people just think it's funny to ride it around and around in a circle yeah. or one out of the cold. Another thing I would add from the economic perspective that I didn't mention before is that when once you make this free, there's no reason for anyone to look at how to officiate it and run services for cheaper yeah one of the pressures for uh, private services for market-based services to deliver cheap goods and services yeah. is there's a consumer there who's exchanging money from it another i could just think of argument after argument another thing is you can't really argue for any standard of service when what's you get what you're getting is for free you go um, oh the conditions are terrible. It smells in here. There's always garbage on it. And you go, well, you're getting it for free. You know, you've got no right to complain. Yeah. What, what's more, even if they do accept you've got a right to complain and you submit your little letter complaint and they send you a little message back saying, thank you so much for your complaint. What incentive do they have to improve their services when you can't take your money elsewhere? Am I right? So ultimately, the, the best way to improve uh, transport is to um, open it up to the free market, let anyone run a bus service, and through market competition, yeah. the price of the trains will come down as well because they have to compete with the buses yeah. and uh, also privatise the roads. And that, that's that's basically. I mean, because I don't even think the Soviet Union had free public transport, did it? I think people, I mean, it was cheap, uh, but it was also awful. As and well. it also, you know, you had no idea whether your train would arrive today or tomorrow or when. You know, yeah. you just had to stay in the train station and hope for the best. Yeah, it sounds like a great plan. Um, it was a central plan, a five year plan, in fact. Yeah. So, uh, you know, people here in the certain factions here in the UK, you know, on the left, are enamoured with these kind of schemes, and they sound it's great. Nice utopian. Yeah, but here's <clears throat> why the Greens are obsessed. Right, most of these things, like the trains, the trams, they run on electricity, and for and if people they want people to use more buses. They're going to have to run more buses on biofuels. None of these things are really env are, are environmentally friendly. As you first think, uh, compared to motor, uh, all those motor vehicles, surely. Well, cars. don't stop calling me surely. But yeah. if you take the amount of people who are then going to get out of their cars and then onto the trains, you're going to have to have more trams, more trains running, more electricity running through the lines. Uh, that's a hell of a lot of. That's a big demand on the on the national grid for electricity, and currently, um, we talk a lot here in Scotland about our renewables and how at one point, one day. Uh, about a year ago, 100% of Scotland's energy requirements <laughs> were, uh, were, were, you know, supplied by green, you know, eco-friendly um, renewable sources such as, uh, not windmills, what do you call them? Yeah, solar panels. <laughs> no, the windy things. Not, right, yeah, the windy things. That's exactly what wind, they're called. Wind turbines. Turbines, wind turbines. But that was that was for a very very short period of time. One day, running at maximum capacity, that cannot supply 
a, a national grid that's going to have uh, free public transport uh, running, you know, extra trains, extra trams. Um, they're going to really have to have a look at this and decide where they're going to get the energy from because the renewables aren't going to cut it. You would have to cover an area the size of a small country <coughs> in you know, uh, wind turbines in order to even get close. And then when there's no wind, we'll get no way of, uh, of, of storing that energy. It's just not viable. Yeah, I'm not um, hopeful for wind. No. Um, whether it's wave energy. Or, and when I, So when I say renewable, that covers wind energy, wave energy, all other sorts of innovative stuff that is, that's heavily publicly subsidized. So that one day where we were getting, you know, uh, 100% of our energy from renewables, it was basically costing us, okay, this is an exaggeration, but, you know, if it's costing you two pounds to produce a pound's worth of electricity, uh, that is not viable in the long term. But back to the transport, uh, I think it's a pretty ludicrous idea. I think Luxembourg's got the wherewithal to make it work for a time. And that's dangerous because that can send a yeah, signal. Send if France signal. starts doing it. It's a lovely Britain idea, but it. at the end of the day, it's funded at the point of a gun. And yeah, it's like, and the, look, it's free public transport. Price controls have never worked anywhere. Like, no. Well, look, the, the drivers doing. who work on the trams and the trains and the buses, they don't work for free, they get paid. So that, you know, that, that money has to come from somewhere. And sooner or later, what the demand, they're going to demand more higher wages as well. So we're going to get a, a situation in which this spirals out of control cost-wise. And once people are used to a public service being free or extremely cheap, it's, it's, it's then hard to privatise it back again. No, and, and that's happened in this country regarding yeah. the rails. They've been privatised and made public, then privatised and made public so many times that they're just, a, they're just a mess, they're just a nuisance. And now what we have is the public-private partnership, which, as Mr. Samarov has pointed out, is the, worst of, is the worst of both worlds, really. Indeed. Anything more to say on that one? Yeah, so Luxembourg, we advise you against this, but not as if you're going to take much notice of us. Um, let's see, let's what, see what we have in the comments. Um yeah, certainly straight white men should never get a seat on the public transport because they're horrible bigots that they are. Yeah, quite. Says your brother, and he also says he needs free underpants. Well, yeah, why, why not? Don't you go yeah. and run a collection. So, um, Adam Smasher, most incompassionately, dubs us the Scottish Sniffly podcast. Yeah, uh, I know it's, it's, it's shocking. Uh, but for that insult, I invite you to a duel. So, yeah. <laughs> Because uh, I, I was uh, we were talking about this earlier, so I might as well mention it. Uh, on our previous podcast, 113, that was oh, uh, a whole an hour ago, we had uh, Jason Manning on who uh, was talking about um, honour culture and how people... You dishonour me, sir. Yeah, people used to fight duels. Yeah. I call you out, sir. Pistols at dawn. Uh, if I'm not completely pistols by 12 o'clock, I usually I'm I throw my gauntlet to the floor. Yeah. I think I would I would I would bring back dueling, not oh, com yeah. not compulsory, but I would I would allow people to do it. We were having a conversation about this. Me too. I think people should be allowed to do it as long as it's uh, clear that they were consenting. But I asked Tom, is it Christian? Uh, is dueling Christian? Yes. Uh, maybe you could make it Christian. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, one of the things I that I don't think so. No, it isn't. It is uh, one of the things that Alexander Hamilton said about the impending duel was it was against his um, Christian and moral beliefs. However, so would he go ahead with it for because he felt like he wouldn't have any credibility unless uh, he defended his honour and people would have thought less of him as an intellectual, a thinker, and a statesman, and what have you. So, um, <clears throat> and given that you think it's unchristian. Yeah. Why do you think that it should be brought back? With it seems to me a sense of glee, like you'd enjoy <laughs> seeing that people doing chilling, as you've said you enjoyed. Well, fighting. we already have boxing, you know. Um, do you enjoy the boxing? I do enjoy the boxing. I enjoyed the Rocky movies. Well, at least the first three, they were pretty. I enjoyed movies. the Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder fight. Um, <coughs> 
it was probably the best heavyweight bout I've seen in a, a long, long time. Uh, yeah, my brother says again, The Duelist. There's a movie, if you want to, if you want to see a film about the absolute ridiculousness, extremes of the, the honour culture, there's a film with Harvey Keitel. I think it's uh, Ridley Scott. Uh, the film's called The Duelists. And Harvey Keitel and Keith Carradine are two officers in the French army during the Napoleonic times. And every time they meet, they end up having a duel. How come they survive? Well, a lot of people did. I mean, basically, the, the, duels were ref the duels were refereed. Uh, and if one person suffered a wound by which he couldn't carry on, then the duel ended. Mm. Um mm. Uh, you know, sometimes you know satisfaction. It depended on the method. Sometimes you duel by swords or by pistols. Uh, I think a lot, a lot of duels were clearly fatal. Many duels did not mm. did not end in death. So these guys, uh, through the, the course of this film, fight a recurring duel every time they meet in the most ridiculous situations. Um, but it's, Harvey Keitel is actually the protagonist because he's the one who instigates it and has this completely warped sense of of honor uh and holds this other guy to it for a, a, you know years and years and years until finally he gets wise so what we need is um <coughs> basically tom woods should be dueling with um nicholas sarwark and uh, steve horwitz and and hopefully bob murphy and krugman <laughs> right. uh, you tell me you wouldn't pay to see that one um yeah but i would like it more to be a boxing match like i would like the dun, 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 dun. Uh, the the drama of them actually slugging it out. Adam Smasher says, "Can we use rapiers? Uh, I think I don't think you have allowed to have rapiers. You know, they're a bit too rapey, <laughs> so you, can, you can't have rapier. You can have Anthony. He's rapier than me. <laughs> uh, I d heavily dispute that." I will run you through with my blade, alack, alack, whatever alack means. I don't know what it means. I have no idea what alack is, but uh, you, every man should have one. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a bit so, like Aleppo. What do you say? You offend my honour, sir. I just like saying that. So. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't even rapier you. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. you, de you deserve to be rapiered. <laughs> so do you, you should get rapiered. It's when it's in the movies, they don't just throw their glove onto the floor. They take their glove off and slap the other person on the face. Right in the coupon with it. It's yeah. uh, overly dramatic. Uh, yeah. It's, but, uh, we're laughing about rapier, by the way. And it, it was there were feminists, and probably still are, who demanded that rape seed uh, should, that should be changed should change the name of rapeseed that wasn't like you know a, a joke that nice. was actually true so uh yeah so anyway i think that's us done for this We've, you've got two episodes you lucky people thanks to all our uh usual uh suspects that joined us adam smasher to my brother david and uh, the hc the hc Thank you. He says that uh, you guys, I don't know what it means as personally, what it means the Scottish Libertarian Movement, should form an alliance with the Family Party and other smaller Scottish parties. Call yourself the Rainbow Alliance. I think there already is one of those. Uh, and drive the SNP Labour Compact and the Parliament totally mental or menthol, even. Menthol. Okay. Don't mess with tunes, don't duel with them because they're <laughs> menthol. <laughs> <laughs> and on that terrible joke. Thanks for tuning in and see you again on the Scottish Liberty Podcast soon.